that uh, was found in a in a meeting it was found in a meeting that a sorry, sorry I got distracted it was found in a place in a site called Santa Maria Acatitlan near Me in the north part of Mexico City is one of a magnificent example of the techniques of Aztec sculpture. And they represent death, but you can see this death is not uh, frightening. This is a death like is present as a natural thing, normal thing. And uh, for, for the people in, in, in the understanding of the Nahua, uh, and in particular Mexica Aztec people, uh, death was understood as that transitional moment in life in which it, it is not good or bad. There is no equ a qualification for it. It's, it's, it, it, it. The issue is not if it's good or bad. It is simply the representation of a natural phenomenon that gives you the opportunity to go to an afterlife that was was called um, uh, Chichihuacualco, uh, Tlalocan, Tonatiuhuicac. There were different types of heavens, of, of, of afterlives, for souls depending on the way they die. Okay? We have here a Katrina made in Michoacán. This picture I took it in, in, in uh, Pátzcuaro, Michoacán. Uh, so we have this character created by uh, uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, who is uh, one of the uh, uh, artists that utilize the concepts of death to represent Mexican culture. And doing that, he produced this uh, kind of approach and more, more naturality uh, uh, without fear to, to deal with death. Since the very early times in Mesoamerica, for example, we have this uh, Maya statuette in which you, you have the, a death god, this older man represents a death god, and this is a, a fecundity or, or a fertility goddess that is represented as a young woman. So you have here the interaction, the uh, flirting, between death and life. And to show the intensity of that, you can follow the hand of the dead god that is touching the uh, leg of the uh, life goddess. So, and this in a, in, a, in a almost funny way represents, uh, or even in a sexual way, represents that union that I spoke in the beginning. That Inseparability, inseparability of the two realities. The Dresden Codex show you the reality of death. This is God, Yun Kimil, and this is one of the dead gods of the Maya pantheon. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, for example, our our great mentor Linda Schiele always, who, who she. She was very outspoken about what she needed to say. She said, hey, what is this? Okay, the dead god and blah, blah, blah. And then, what is this? Well, this is guaj, this is a tamal, no? This is the, the word for food or, 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 or more in particular, tamal, guaj. Representing that death consumes the products of life, especially a tamal represents the blood of human beings because the Mayas believe that human beings, their, 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 their energy, their blood was created out of corn. So we were people of the corn. So the fact that it comes a god and takes away the essence of our flesh represents death. No? There is a transformation that is happening here. And then she said, and what is this? So everybody we imagined something, but we didn't want to say because we were very, very uh, embarrassed to say. And she said, don't be shy. This is a flatulence. This, this, this is, a, this is a, a fart. So, that, so she, she, 
because life, death has a terrifying aspect also. It's not, it, it's not just a, somewhere you want to, 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 to make a friend, but it has a terrifying aspect and, 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 and an aspect that is not so nice always to people. Uh, one of the issues that the friars, the Franciscan friars and the, and the members of the Catholic Church that came for the evangelization in Mexico was some very curious and somewhat contradictory issues. Uh, for example, Christianity believes that you need to do merits and you need to have a good life a life of service, a life of helping others, a life of faith, a life of honoring God, so you can be saved. Your salvation depends on how you live. But the Colombian people didn't believe in that. They thought you go to another life depending on how you live, how was, sorry, not how you live, how you die. Okay? So if you die in an event related to water, we, you go with Atutlalocan. If you die in warfare or in a, a ceremonial kind of event, you go to the uh, heaven of the, of the, of the sun, etc. So we have a big difference here. Salvation for the Christians depends on morality. If I was good, I did good things. And, and salvation for the indigenous people depended in the way you die, no, and independently of any morality. Morality was dealt with during life. That's why, for example, the Aztec society was a very strict society that punished with capital uh, 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 penalties any uh, 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 infraction of, 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 of the law. Uh, the Mayas have a goddess called Ishtab, that is this one here, that is the goddess of suicide. In Christianity, suicide for many years was seen as something terrible, a big stigma, to the point if you had a close relative who committed suicide, you tell people, ah, how, how he died? Oh, he died from a heart attack, you said, because it was embarrassing to admit it was a suicide. So, in that sense, uh, the Mayas resolved this issue with a goddess. People who committed suicide is because life is difficult to live. Life has overwhelming problems. And sometimes not everybody can deal and manage those problems. And when they lose, the faith in their own life, they commit suicide. They try to liberate themselves from this the misery of, of existence. Uh, but it was not seen as a stigma in that culture. In fact, the goddess Ishtab came from heavens to take that person and take it with her. So uh, the, the, the Mayas were very accepting of suicide in the grounds of a, a self-liberation of a problem that people couldn't deal with. And that was not seen as morally wrong or anything. So these differences created some difficulties in the communication of the two religions. But at the same time, there were coincidences that facilitated the conversion and the exchange between the two cultures. One of the most powerful ones is precisely the coincidence that when, when the, the friars came and told the indigenous people, I am thinking in the Mexica, the Aztecs in this moment, uh, and they said, hey, our God Jesus Christ was born in a virginal way from his mother, Virgin Mary. I am sure that the Aztec said, ah, that is not new for us. No, no, no problem, we don't believe. Because Kuatlikwe, our earth goddess, our, the, the mother of the gods, 
had with Jesus personally in a marginal way also. So, they said, these guys called Jesus Christ with Jesus personally and called Virgin Mary to what what is the problem? No? So, they want us to call it that way, we can use the name, but for us, it continues being our main God and our great goddess. So, this is the way in how the evangelization could happen and settle in a, a, in a transculturation process beyond a, a, or without the need of violence, okay, between the two cultures. Uh, this is a Maya lintel where you see one of the Maya queens invoking an ancestor in a hypnotic trance procedure. I don't have too much time to speak about this, but uh, you can continue by your own. So she's invoking the, an ancestor to come to legitimize some of her government actions. So she's doing the offering, the invocation, and then there comes a snake. The snakes, this, is, this particular snake is called the vision serpent. The, the serpent of visions. And uh, this uh, the, the vision serpent is the conduit that links the sky with the earth. And through his mouth, she, she is spitting an ancestor that is coming back to life to connect and to communicate with the living person. Here, in uh, the year 600 AD, where this uh, panel was made, we have here one of the proofs of the pre-Columbian origin of the Day of the Dead. Because we see a human being alive invoking and bringing through the conduit that link the two reals and ancestor. This is exactly what with a, with a Christianized way, but this is exactly what our people today see in Mexico, this connection. So there is an ancestor, a dead individual coming to earth again to legitimize and to support what the royalty is doing here, or in this case, this, this queen. We find in the um, it's a sarcophagus of King Pakal, of, of, of the city of Palenque, a very powerful thing. This is the, uh, the uh, this is a replica of the, of the uh, chamber, the funeral chamber with the sarcophagus, because for uh, reasons of preservation, they don't allow people to visit the original one in the city, in, in situ, in Palenque, so you, 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 need, you can see uh, this and figure out how it is visiting the Museum of Anthropology of Mexico City. Well, there is King Pakal buried, and there is a lid that is covering the sarcophagus, that is this one. Let me go into the drawing that is easier to, to read. What is happening here? We have a king dressed in the guise of the bed of the corn god, of the base god, who is uh, falling down, being swallowed by the a monster of earth. So you see the earth is swallowing him. He's dying and going. In the moment he is dying and, go, and, and goes into the depth of the earth, in that very moment emerges the tree of life here. That is the Seba tree. It's, this is simultaneous. He's going down, and in that moment, automatically is coming down. And on top, we have the sun god represented with a, with a bear. So you have the tree of life, that is the source of all life, of fertility, that includes the human beings in that, in that cycle, and this is proven by this. And uh, and this is, this is mimicking the cycle of corn. What happened with corn? You get a seed of corn, plant it, the seed of corn decomposes, dies in the earth, and what happened? 
emerges the plant of corn or life. So from death comes life. That's the way nature operates. And that's the same way that human beings that are seeds of that nature in its own day or in their own, they also have that life, death, and resurrection cycle. And this is proven here. In the 70s, there was a guy, Eric von Daniken, who made a lot of money claiming that this was a UFO, an extraterrestrial, and uh, he was in, a, in, a, in the cockpit of a cabin of a, of a spaceship, and, and, and all of these were levers that he was controlling. Well, now that archaeology has been able to read the hieroglyphs of the Maya, we can eliminate those type of ideas, because I still have heard guides in Palenque that still tell this story about the UFO. So, so then uh, those people are have a very anachronic knowledge now. OK. This is the Tlalocan, a painting made in Teotihuacan, representing the afterworld, the paradise of Tlaloc, as a world of fertility, you see, a, of vegetation, of life in all aspects. People is living and speaking and singing and playing games, including the ball game here, as they did in life. So this is a parallel life, in an in, in analogic life in the afterworld. These are images of Diego Rivera. Uh, this image of the soldier carrying um, the arm of a woman here, uh, you would find it as kind of strange. But this is a practice uh, that uh, the warriors did because the soldiers did, especially the young ones, uh, because it was believed that women who died in childbirth were uh, became, became goddesses. And, and then soldiers went to the funerals of those Siguateteo, as they have been called, those, those goddesses. And they stole parts of, of the body, fingers, or an arm of the deceased to use them as amulets for good life in the in war. So Diego Rivera, with his magnificent uh, uh, quality as an artist, he represented human sacrifice and uh, these type of practices in a very artistic way. This is a, an image that comes from the codices. Uh, we have, this is Quatlicue, the, the, the earth goddess that we have mentioned. Uh, last year, uh, our art history society made a, a very beautiful art altar of the dead in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery that was dedicated to Quatlicue. Because Quatlicue represents being the earth, she represents that the earth takes life and gives life. So there is a dual aspect in the earth. She's a giver of life, but she's a taker of life. She produces death. And that makes her to be a dual element. Uh, well, the so called uh, 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 Virgin of Guadalupe appeared in the same shrine near Tenochtitlan where uh, uh, was worshipped uh, the goddess Quatlicue. So there is no surprise that a, 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 a dark skin Virgin Mary who had Jesus Christ in a virginal way, in the same way Quatlicue had within a person in a virginal way, there was that equation. And it, it was the same principle, uh, uh, just uh, uh, called by two different names. Okay, so there is the the equation between the Virgin of Guadalupe and Quatlicue. This is uh, Jorge Gonzalez Camarena, one of the great muralists of the of the forties and to to seventies. Uh, uh, just a little bit younger than Diego Rivera and and and. and, and and uh, Orozco, uh, he represented the conquest like this. There is no a clear winner, because in the moment the Spanish is killing this, well, that Cortes is killing Cuauhtémoc, Cuauhtémoc is able to kill Cortes, representing 
precisely that painful process of mestizaje that started 500 years ago, and through a process of transculturation has produced a mestizo culture with the contributions of all the indigenous peoples around the, 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 the country of Mexico and all the uh, 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 Spaniards from different regions and different places that had local uh, uh, traditions and, and they mixed. So Christianity came in that way. We have this open chapel in Tlaxcala, beautiful place that there was a huge atrium here where people came to attend masses and, and religious ceremonies. The image of Christ uh, supplanted the main deities, the, the supreme gods of the a, a previous tradition. And this image that uh, I, I cherish a lot, this is, uh, and, the, and, and it's very rarely people can see it in the way I saw it. This is an image of Jesus Christ that is located in the, uh, oh, uh, in, the um, Posa, in one of the Posa chapels in the monastery of Texcoco near Mexico City. And this is a, a, a god that can be changed in different positions, so it can be taken in procession as a dead Christ, and always he is covered, his, his body is covered with uh, this uh, kind of tunic, but uh, they were restoring the chapel, so they put the Christ in the altar, and they, and, and they, they remove the covers, and, and you can see the, the dramatic image with, uh, you can see the ribs and the very deep wounds. And many people find this uh, disgusting. No, I don't think uh, Christ was faking when he had his pain. You know? and, uh, and he is, um, re he represents that Jesus Christ came to surpass or to supersede the, 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 uh, the customs of death made by human beings to bring eternal life and bring salvation to people. That is the reason why the, the tradition of the human sacrifices of the pre-Columbian people were a kind of uh, compared to this type of representation because they found their, 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 some beliefs of their own linked to this type of, of manifestations and representations. Because basically the message is, there is no need that you make more human sacrifices because there was the man God, Jesus Christ, who already did his own sacrifice and that supersedes any other sacrifice of human beings. So you can see the idea of the tree of life also came uh, from a biblical quotation of the tree of Jesse. You can see St. Francis of Assisi from, who, from his uh, heart are coming the branches of different martyrs of Christianity. And uh, I think uh, one of the most important colonial monuments that show this syncretism, this uh, 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 mixing of uh, uh, visions between the two cultures is the cross of Acolman, this one, the monastery of Acolman near Mexico City. And this is a, a, a perfect, this is the original one you can see, the, and this is the drawing so we can see more details. Here you have the face of Jesus Christ emerging from this cross and, and he's defeating the death because he's stepping on death and he's defeating death because he resurrected. Uh, notice that the Francisca, the, this, pardon, the Augustinians who were the ones who made this uh, convent, the indigenous people were the ones who made the cross, but they were the ones who ordered the construction of the, of the uh, convent. Uh, and you can see, for example, the emblem of the Augustinian was a heart pierced by arrows. And the, this is the, the emergence of the hair of Christ with the, the crown of thorns. In the 16th century, the uh, Spanish uh, priests never represented a crucifix, a crucifix of full body because that could 
made the made it, uh, understood by the indigenous people as that they also encouraged the human sacrifices. So the image of the crucified Christ came until the end of the 16th century, once the indigenous people had more or less understood the, the uh, or uh, philosophical and theological points that were behind these representations. But in the 16th century, what the indigenous people saw as an equivalent of the cross was the tree of life. This is a tree of life where in the Maya, uh, in, the, in the Maya uh, panel in Palenque, we see a, a, a tree of corn, a plant of corn, in which the red god is coming out from the center because you know the, the, the arms of the cross are equivalent to the arms of the corn plant. And you see the image of the maize god coming out from the crossing. In the same way, Jesus Christ come out from the crossing. And look, there are the elements of the Passion of Christ, all the instruments you utilize in the Passion of Christ, but the indigenous people added these vines with flowers that were wrapped around the cross. So basically, this monument, this sculpture, had two meanings. This is a single a sculpture with two readings. One is indigenous and the other Christian. And both are totally compatible in this way. Uh, because you have the full meaning in each of the traditions and, and in that way you can pray or, 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 or see this monument from your own uh, referential frame. For example here, why they put these vines with uh, flowers and because when they plant corn in the milpas, you know, in the, the, the corn fields, they also put beans or squashes uh, they planted around the, the corn. And then the vine of the beans and squashes go up through the, the stalk of the corn plant and wrapped, they wrapped around it. In doing that, they all share different nutrients. So the three plants grow better. Uh, so that is wisdom, no? the agricultural wisdom of our ancient people, and is present here. For the indigenous people of Akolman, they are seeing the maize god producing fertility, producing life that defeats death. And from the Christian point of view, you have Jesus Christ in the cross, defeating death for the salvation of humanity. So this is the point in which any tradition we see today in Mexico, rooted in pre-Columbian origins, is also accompanied or substituted by certain elements of Christianity. And this is exactly what happened in our tradition of day of the death. This is a Quauhxicalli, an Aztec Quauhxicalli that was a recipient for human hearts during the sacrifices that produced death, here it is, and see what happened. With Christianity, the Indians were the ones who constructed these monuments. They put this, because from what they learned, this monument that represents Christ is also defeating death and is substituting for the human sacrifices that used to be done previously, and that is, you can see here, the Huaxicali of human sacrifices, and you have the actual cross emerging there. One comes out of the other and is alive. You know, exactly what, what happened with, with the cycle of corn. Same thing can be said for, for the heaven, the understanding of heaven, the, the torments of, the, of, the, of, of, of uh, hell that were equated to certain tortures that, that the indigenous people did in their, in their times. I will skip some images because I want to... In, in Christianity, we have the interpretation of life and death as a fight between goodness and evil. You see the demons against the angels. This is a very dramatic colonial way of seeing that. A priest reflecting about his own death 
the presence of death represented by this panel. The, the, uh, the, these, um, again, reflections about death representing that this is something uh, that will happen to everybody. And this is the typical, um, uh, when we go to get uh, ash in the, in the uh, uh, ash Wednesdays every year, uh, that we, we recite a formula that says, uh, polvo eres y en polvo te convertirás, you are dust and you will become dust. And this is a, a young woman who is reflecting into that. The way, uh, in the way you look, I was. And the way you look, my skeleton, you will be. No? It's, it's a, and this is the formula saying, said here by, by this young girl. There were funeral empires that they, the, representing that death is riches, clergymen, rich people, kings, poor people, peasants, everybody. There is only one of these left. There are two left in this in the whole American continent. One is in the Museum of Toluca uh, near Mexico City, and the other is in uh, the, the city of Tasco in Guerrero. And I will come to the, I will be uh, wrapping up my talk with uh, some um, present day representations. This is what we have said, no? She of the skirt of snakes, representing the earth that has given life for, for millennia. That's why she had sagging breasts of an old woman who had been nurturing the world. And at the same time, she's receiving the sacrifice of individuals as an offering for her to give us more things. So to remember Rani, a very um, brilliant artist that we have at the turn of the 20th century, we called this uh, panel that is part of a bigger, larger panel called Our Gods. And she represents Quaclique. This is Quaclique with the same figure we are seeing here. Quaclique was the mother of Uchiro Pochli. But look, in the Mexico of today, the one who is coming out from her womb is Jesus Christ. This is exactly a beautiful way to represent the syncretism, the transculturation of what the Mexican people is today. Where these two traditions fuse in a very complicated blend, and uh, the old gods with the, with the, with, 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 the, with the new god and the saints merged, and, and basically uh, substituted for 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 certain traditions that were done in the past with with the Spanish traditions, and they became dual in some way. So you have what liquid giving birth to Jesus Christ, that is a, a, not, is, a, is a new Christian way to, to refer to Uchiro Koshli. So you have, this is the body, you can see the arm, and then it, it is the, 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 uh, the, the hand of the uh, uh, death Christ. And you have the same here, the body continues here, and then you have the other hand here. And most part of the, the head of Jesus Christ and the hair coming out, and the rest of the body is still inside of the earth. And you can see the emergence of part of the uh, uh, legs and, and, and one foot. So it's beautiful the way Jesus Christ is emerging from the earth. It's in the same way he emerged from the virginal womb of Virgin Mary. And this God is appearing in the place where uh, Guizillo Porsley was appealing for the indigenous people. Our Gods by Saturnino Hernández. Our artists represented death in many different ways, but Diego Rivera comes in the chapel of Chapingo, and he represents a, a death revolutionary who is being mourned by 
uh, his countries. And from the death of the revolutionary uh, a, a man, a soldier, is coming the rebirth of the tree. So the tree of life comes out from the seeds represented by the blood of this dead soldier who is fertilizing the earth to produce life. This is an almost religious kind of, of representation uh, that is beautiful. It's, it's, uh, there are no words to ponder our Mexican muralist enough because they, they did a great job in, in teaching the people of the 20th century in how to interpret our history and how to see the values of the struggles that people have had during the very um, complicated history of Mexico. So that is, a, this, this panel is called Revolution Germination. This is Clemente Orozco representing the birth of the false knowledge given in many uh, formal uh, educational institutions. This is in Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in, 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 in the United States. Uh, and this is the uh, Christ of Dartmouth uh, who comes, realizes that there is nobody to say because human beings have killed each other by their own ambitions. And then he comes, destroys his own cross in anger, saying that his mission had failed. He, he, he created human beings to live eternal life, and they were not even able to survive by themselves. No? So it's a very powerful um, image that some people in the ferries saw as a heretical Christ by Clemente Rosso. Frida Kahlo, uh, who had a very constant thinking of, about death for a large part of her life, you can see, especially the last 15 years of her life. Look. So that tells you uh, how it's present in the pre-Columbian, in the colonial, and the more modern Mexico, the image of death. It's a constant that accompanies us. This is Frida uh, in her deathbed. The famous Guadalupe Posada, who created these characters uh, in which he represents Mexico utilizing the uh, calaveras, the, the skeletons, the famous Calavera Catrina. No? This is the, the skeleton of President Madero, the one who started the Mexican Revolution. This is a, 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 crit, a criticism against newspapers. And uh, the calaveras that are these uh, literary compositions made in verse to, to, to make fun of people uh, sometimes well known or, or just different uh, uh, people from different trades of life. In, in, and, and with those poems, they, they talk about their own lives and deaths. Uh, 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 in, in, and this is a kind of a funny kind of uh, a, 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 a poetic piece that we call Calaveras. Diego Rivera, who linked himself to the tradition of Guadalupe Posada, you can see the link, because Diego and the other muralists recognized Jose Guadalupe Posada as the founder, together with Dr. Atl, the founder of the, of the modern Mexican school of art in the 20th century. And this is Calavera Catrina, who appears as the grandmother of Diego, who has his mother Frida next to, to him. So this is a very beautiful way in which Diego Rivera is painting his memories of his childhood in this beautiful mural called the, the mural of the Alameda Park. Mexican people represent with flowers, represents a hope, their, their, their mourning for their death. In the 19th century, we have, for example, the Angelitos. Yesterday was the coming of the Angelitos. That is when the dead children come back to earth to accompany, well, it's when they died and then they come back to earth to visit their families. And this is a a painting made for one of those angelitos because people wanted to have a memory of them. 
And, and the famous altars of the dead, that is offerings that we give to our dead people. This is a, 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 a Central Mexico type of altar in the way of the offering represented by Diego Rivera here. Here. This is an amazing painting uh, called Tata Jesucristo of the pain and the moment of a dramatic mourning. And these people are mourning a cadaver that is exactly set where we are placed looking at the picture. So this is a reflection of our own mortality. It's, it's amazing. This is by Francisco Goitia, made in the 50s, uh, and it's called Tata Jesucristo. The Day of the Dead festivals that we celebrate uh, uh, with a lot of uh, folklore and, and, and as a happy kind of celebration. This is an altar from the Yucatan Peninsula. You can see the huipiles. You can see the, this is the, uh, 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 the, the, mobile po the mobile pollo. The, 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 this is a typical Maya indigenous dish that is kind of an equivalent to a type of mole of that region. And you have the famous pan de muerto, the, the calaveritas that are everywhere. And this is uh, an altar made in Michoacán. I took this picture many years ago in Sinsunza, Michoacán, in the moment they were preparing the, the, the altar. They were, they were uh, mourning the, the people in the altar, uh, the dead people. And then this is how this, this look, this one is this one, how it look when all the lights were on, all the flowers, all the papel picado, everything, all the elements are that, I, uh, that my students are going to explain you how to do it and the meanings of those elements in a moment. Uh, so this is how a cemetery look during the days of the dead. It is all these pictures from Michoacan. And I would like to, to end this talk before giving a few minutes for um, a few questions. What, after we have seen all this, and we have seen the origins and history of this tradition, and how this tradition looks when, when we make offerings to our dead, so during the time that we open that portal of communication, that is between October 31st to the rest of November. Uh, with the main day for the adults to come in, is the night between today and tomorrow, from the first to the second. So we are in perfect timing with our, with our small festival that we are doing now. I will just tell you exactly what a Mexican person, especially in the Indian towns where this tradition has survived, because in many of the big cities, this tradition is, is disappearing. But in the more traditional towns, like uh, this painting shows, a woman, indigenous woman, is putting the food that the ancestors liked. And the belief is that you put the food that was favorite of the ancestors you are uh, uh, celebrating. For example, if there was a child, you put toys, you put chocolates, you put candies, and if there was an adult person who loved, uh, let's say, mole with chocolate, you put that, or you put uh, cochinita pibil from a other type of uh, mole, et cetera, et cetera. Or you put quesadillas, or you put whatever there was, or tequila, or whatever was of the liking of those people that you are celebrating. So you give this offering during the funerary uh, morning in the cemetery, it is believed that the spirits of your dead right here, they come and are around you. Even if you don't see them, they are there. People are praying rosaries and other type of, of prayers. And, and, and this is a very, very, um, a, 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 more, it's a moment of great a, a, a faith, a great connection between the people who have left this world that are visiting and the families that are uh, uh, living there. So this is a very, very 
crucial moment that happens during, during all night. So in the morning, after they believe that their dead people came and impregnated all this food, because they spiritually are coping and touch the food, because they are remembering what they did in life. Well, the next day in the morning, as a breakfast, all the members of the family sat around the table and they eat that food that was impregnated by their ancestors. And that is a true communion between the living and the dead. This is irrational of the day of the dead. Nobody expects that your abuelito, your grandfather is going to materialize there and talk to you. No, imagine the amount of uh, uh, heart attacks that would happen and you will duplicate the dead people in the cemetery that day. No? So no, it's, it's, it's understood from a very spiritual way uh, and people really feel it. You ask people, they, they, they feel and believe that the strong odor of the Sempasuchiles and the colors of the altar attracted their, their dead people to come back and be with them. So with this, I uh, finish my talk showing you that in the same way we have cities, uh, the, the, the cemeteries in some places are true cities of the dead. Look, where there you have churches, you have houses, and there are streets. So we have this place is, is a dwelling of the dead as we have our dwelling in the same reality. The only a critical moment that is very cultural for us is the moment of the connection between this city of death and our city of living ones. Thank you very much. And please, if you have um, any question, please, uh, I, I will be glad to answer if uh, you have any questions. If not, a, well, we are going to post this lecture later so you can come back and see it again or share it with uh, other friends of you that were not here. Uh, and uh, so if there are no questions, then the uh, Art History Society uh, members are going to continue with the second part of this event. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one question, Profe, in the chat from yes. Carlos Sam Herrera. They asked how accurate the Pixar movie Coco, which you mentioned earlier, um, how accurate was it according to beliefs in Michoacán? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Carlos Herrera is a friend of mine for a long time from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. That is, is my hometown. Thank you, Carlos, for the question. Well, basically, uh, that, that is a very good question that many people have um, uh, uh, brought to the attention. In the same way, people ask how accurate was the movie Apocalypto uh, about indigenous life, no? In, well, uh, there is always uh, the possibility that these type of movies make cultural errors no? because they, they uh, may miss certain details or misinterpret certain details. But I can tell you, uh, within the Hollywoodesque type of uh, attire that Coco has, in reality, I found it very, very near our reality because these individuals who made the movie went for uh, many months to, or perhaps even a year or, or something, but, but I know that for many months they were traveling in Mexico and visiting communities and interviewing people and filming certain kind of celebrations so they could make the movie based in real things. So in my opinion, that there can be other opinions about it, but in my opinion, it's very accurate, I would say. Uh, I, I, I only uh, add the point that there are some Hollywoodesque liberties and, and, and certain elements that make a plot that is emotional and attractive for people because most people ended crying a lot in that movie. And, and, that, and that is part of the, the day of the dead, uh, the real day of the dead that happens in the communities of Mexico every year had those type of emotional components and 
and I think they they recreated them in the in the screen very well. So that's my opinion. Well, Erica Garcia has a question. You're able to um, unmute yourselves. You like if you like to ask a question as well, or if you'd like to type it in the chat, someone from the um, Art History Society could ask. So, Erica, if you want to unmute yourself, you can. Sorry, it's because I'm still in my PJs. Hi, profe. Hi, Hello, Erica. Um, I wanted to ask, well, April and I wanted to ask, because we're messaging about the lecture, if there are any other cultures like around the world since you're very familiar, so since you've traveled and have studied, if there are other cultures around the world that celebrate something similar to this tradition. Uh, yes. With a, that's a, a great question. With a certain variation, there is a commonality between many countries of Asia and Latin America, because Latin American countries follow a, a kind of a tradition similar to Mexico, because there is that mestizaje between Spaniards also there with indigenous groups. So then you can see that there are uh, rituals that are similar not identical to ours, probably Mexican Day of the Dead is the most uh, colorful event and, and more spectacular in, in that sense. But yes, the Latin American countries have similarity in the, especially the ones that have a more Indian background. La, uh, for example, Argentina, Chile is, is a kind of a different type. It's more European the way they, they see things. But the Peru, Ecuador, Paraguay, Bolivia, well, is has a lot of similarities to, to the understanding of life and death. And Asia, I have seen in Korea, I have seen in Japan, I have seen in China, a very interesting uh, a, a, a ceremonies, of course, in their own way, with their own type of traits and, 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 and customs, but they have similar kind of uh, uh, practices to our culture. Not to say Filipinas, no? Philippines that are basically like another Mexico in the, in, in, in the Far East, no? But, but uh, and, and yes, I, I was very surprised to see in, in Japan no? that, that, that they had this culture uh, very deep into the, the connection with the dead to the point that they have a shrine uh, in, in, in Tokyo where all the main people that died in the Second World War, uh, they, they have a special ceremonial kind of permanent tomb com community, and they go every year to do a memorial to them. So there are certain customs, and, and they also have a certain type of uh, a ghosts or souls that come during that day and communicate with people. So there are certain similarities, but I would say still uh, hoping not uh, not to um, exaggerate, but that the, the, the Mexican uh, celebration of that is much more intensive and much more, um, we can say, outspoken than any other one. That, that would be my answer. Gracias, profe. Welcome. Looks like Lori. Thank you, Erica. That was a wonderful question. It looks like Lori Rush has a question as well. You're free to ask, uh, Miss Rush. Hola, maestro. ¿Qué pasó? <laughs> ¿Cómo estás, Lori? <laughs> Muy bien. So I want to know how you and your students feel when you walk into the dollar store and you see all of the iconography of Dia de Muertos right next to Halloween. And how have you seen that change in recent years? That's a great question. I would like to give the chance to my students to ask first, and, and after that, I can give any opinion. But I would like you first with your experience of living uh, in this country and at the same time having the, the uh, uh, Mexican or Latin American background, uh, 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 you, you can, you can uh, uh, Give your opinions, please. I can go first. I can definitely tell you uh, every time I walk into a Halloween store, it doesn't matter if it's the dollar store or Spirit Halloween. I always, they're always right next to each other. 
and it always sparks a conversation and it's almost a yearly thing that ends up happening. I go to the section and I ask, hey, do you have any uh, skulls? And they're like, yeah, there's a skeleton over there. I'm like, no, no, like with calaveras, like with decoration. And they're like, what are you talking about? And then I show them pictures and it ends up me talking to an employee, telling them what I'm talking about and then them talking to their staff and them trying to help me find what I get. And I end up teaching them about <laughs> Dia de los Muertos for like 30 seconds a year. <laughs> and honestly, it's one of my favorite traditions because it's one of those things where people will group it together and not truly understand what they're doing by that. And it's only through, it's only through the grace of God that these people are so kind that they want to listen <laughs> for a second to what I'm talking about that, that we can actually have that conversation. But yeah, it's a very complicated feeling to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, I could go as well. I concur with Alegria. I think it is a complicated feeling. It's beautiful that people are willing. Um, well, it depends if they're willing to learn about the actual background of the calaveras and the, and the flowers and all the symbolism that goes behind it that we'll be discussing in the making of our shoebox ofrenda. When people just um, assume that it's a fun other way to celebrate Halloween, then it's frustrating. But when people take the time and want to want to learn about the meaning and the symbolism in the historic context, then um, if things such as decorations open up that um, curiosity, then it's something beautiful, I, I think. Can I answer as an ex alum? <laughs> always an alum. As a recent Go for it. Do I still count? Um, I would say it's kind of like, uh, it's a 50-50, in my opinion. On one end, it is a thing of like appropriation, uh, similar to Cinco de Mayo, how it's been appropriated over the years and will continue to be appropriated, uh, regardless of the historic background of it. But it's also another thing too of like, families who don't have a, the accessibility to get things from other, other places can go to the dollar store and find those items for their ofrenda. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of like, I don't know, a hit or miss, but also like it kind of, it hurts a little bit sometimes because it is always by like the candy, which I mean, we still put on our altar, um, but it's by like the scary things for Halloween or things like that. Um, but I agree with Sara and Alegria. I think it's a matter of folks who are open to it, open to learning about it um, that make a difference. Uh, but that's a really hard question to answer because I don't know. I think it's a, I don't know. I don't know how to feel like 50 50 sometimes. I understand that it's there for accessibility, but then I'm also like, okay, it doesn't need to be here, but it also does need to be here. It's a weird, weird relationship I guess, <laughs> that I have with it, at least. And we have one more question, it looks like, from Ariel. Um, Hernandez, hi Ariel. Um, have you noticed certain Day of the Dead traditions in the U.S. influencing the way it's currently celebrated in Mexico? Profe? <laughs> Can you repeat again because I lost the track. Um, have you noticed certain Day of the Dead traditions in the United States influencing the way it's currently celebrated in Mexico? That's a very good question. Uh, yes, well, I, I think the the majority of uh, altars of the dead and the majority of um, offerings that people put in, in their houses, cemeteries, different uh, practices here in the States. In general, because now you can get all the materials and ingredients here, in the past, it was more difficult to uh, replicate something where you didn't have the right materials. But now you can find everything, papel picado, flowers, eh, eh, pan de muerto, all the different elements eh, you can find them now. So I would say that in general are very, and, and also eh, many of the people who make the altars are people directly coming from Mexico or their sons or grandsons that are very familiar with those traditions. So I would think to the, that, that in the last few years, I would see that are almost identical the way the, the, the craftsmanship of the altars are. The difference are, for example, in the type of um, 
uh, for example, uh, the type of figures when, when they try to, um, to honor some famous people, sometimes you may see James Dean or you may see uh, Michael Jackson there in the pictures that are celebrating. And you say, well, this is not uh, exactly Mexican, but they are including that to their own abuelitos and their own people. And that is, uh, uh, but the setting is basically uh, similar or, or, or identical. And I think uh, also the, um, the tradition here uh, is also probably as accepting certain elements of Halloween that, that here and there filters into the altars, but, but not, not to a point to, in my view, to um, destroy the, 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 the meaning or make it too distant from the way it happens in Mexico. Because in, also in Mexico, there is influence of Halloween and there has been some um, a, a people who have kind of mixed or, 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 or misconceived certain things. And there are also some level of syncretism. But I would uh, think, uniting your question with the previous question, that you, we will see at some point that there will be certain level of transculturation and syncretism in which the Day of the Dead will become a, a kind of um, mainstream type of activity in, in, the, in the long run as the, the traditions that are more accepted by everybody in the same way, basically, I haven't seen uh, so far any American that don't like Mexican food, for example. There, sh there, there should be some that don't like it, but I haven't found any yet. So, and they see Mexican food as something typical already of the United States. So people see Mexican food as part of the standard food of the United States, especially in the Southern states. So it's something very familiar. So I think, uh, all those traditions will be embedded in the society in a much more open way. And, and they, may, they, may, they may suffer some alterations in some way, but I think we'll, we'll make more universal this, this tradition and more accepted as something that belongs to everybody in this country, for example. But, but so far, I have not seen really um, the only thing I, and I will, I will finish with is that I can tell that may be different to Mexico is that uh, in uh, the altars of the dead I have seen here, many of them try to hide or not to show very um, openly a Christian elements because they may be related to the Spanish conquest. So in, I can see in a kind of a discreet way how some of those elements are a little bit eliminated in, in order that the, that the altar would like the most indigenous as possible. In Mexico, there is not that thing, at least so consciously. People, people ac accept this tradition as part of a Christian background and is basically always linked to Christian symbols. That put, could be a, a little bit of a difference of what I see here to, 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 to Mexico. But in general, I think uh, a, most Mexicans that would come here and see an altar of the dead would feel like, uh, ah, we are celebrating this in the, in, in the same way we, we do it, you know, in general. Thank you, Profe. Thank you for answering Thank those you. questions. Again, a wonderful, wonderful lecture. It gives everyone so much context about what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to mean, and how in these ways it keeps evolving and evolving, just like information. And thank you again, Profe, for giving that wonderful lecture and having your wonderful time spent with us today on Dia de los Muertos. Thank you. Thank you, you and, and all our audience for, for accompanying us in a Sunday for, for this, this talk and this event. And, and wait to hear what is coming in a moment. Exactly. So as of this moment, that concludes the lecture and the Q&A.